The reason I think passive income is good is because theoretically, if you could make an extra 500 pounds a month, 1000 pounds a month from a thing that you didn't have to spend your own time doing, that means you can tick that box of economic engine and then you can spend your time doing the stuff you actually want to do. Maybe that'll involve quitting your actual job and doing something different, maybe involve going part time, maybe involve spending more time with your family and kids and stuff. Having that financial freedom is life changing. And passive income is one path on that route to financial freedom, which is ultimately on that route to living a happy, healthy, fulfilled life. Ali Abdal, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Look at this lovely studio that we're in. I know. It's still a work in progress. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so We've just got loads of forest, like plants in the background. Yeah, we are in some foliage. I haven't here. figured out a name for them yet, but I feel like Harry Potter characters. Name, or yeah, characters this, that's very like that. you. Yeah, it's got very you. Uh, so I've just recorded on your show. You have? I'm going to return the favor. Fantastic. And talk about stuff on mine. What, and are, we, what are we talking about? I want to talk about passive income. Oh, okay, which is sure. Another one of your specialist subjects. I think. Hmm. Yeah, I've done a lot of reading around it and dabbled with it. So let's see, let's see where the conversation goes. One of the interesting things is that for most people, income is, we're not really taught about passive income and multiple in- income streams. The, the absolute peak that most people will get is earn more than you spend mm. and try and get a, put money into a pension or some sort of ISA yeah. of some kind there's not really a very good understanding of how you spread your risk about how you can have multiple income streams. Yep. Maybe people who are not self-employed don't think that this is the sort of thing they should be doing. For people who are self-employed, they might not have the time or the understanding to actually be able to work out what they should do. So mm-hmm. if you're talking to someone about passive income, what's a, why should someone even be bothered? Why should someone even think about it as an option? Yeah, Um so the way I, the reason I think of it as being being a good thing is, I think ultimately we're all trying to live a life that's like happy and meaningful and fulfilled and stuff. Like that's that's ultimately where we're all aiming at. With even even with all the stuff with all the stuff you talk about in the show, that's that's our, our our destination. Now the reason a bit a big part of why we might not get to that destination, you know, there are there are various hurdles that can get in the way. For example, if you have a major health problem, the, and or like yeah yeah for example if you have like a major health problem that kind of gets in the way of you living your best life and so you want to try and solve that health problem and if you for example people who have chronic back pain say that it just adds a real downer to their quality of life forever like there's, there's not much you can do about that and i think when it comes to money uh we all need money to survive um and the way that most of us make that money that we need to survive is by doing a thing a job that we go to for 40 hours plus a week that we spend eighty thousand hours of our lives doing now, if you could magically make everyone not need that money to survive, then I think we would be more more free to live our best life. And and and, and the way I think of it is, it's almost like in in board games. I don't know. Have you have you ever played those like really long three hour long type board games? No, but I know that you absolutely <laughs> love these. So Freaking love that stuff. Tell me about them. Um, and and so there's a game called Agricola, which is like it's it's like Farmville, but like board game format. That I used to play with my friends at uni. Um, and in a lot of these kind of strategy board games, you need to create for yourself an economic engine of some sort, whether that is like, I don't know, breeding sheep or getting collecting hay or collecting wood or being the person who lays brick within the context of the board game. And once you've built your economic engine, at that point, you can start winning, like moving towards victory points and, and winning the game. And I think in real life, we all need an economic engine of some sort. And it would be really nice in a dream world if the thing that we did to make money is also the thing that makes it brings us passion and joy and genuinely contributes to us living our best life but for most people including for me that thing is not the same as the thing that makes me money uh and so a long answer to the question like the reason i think passive income is good is because theoretically if you could make an extra 500 pounds a month thousand pounds a month 1500 dollars a month from a thing that you didn't have to spend your own time doing that means you can tick that box of economic engine and then you can spend your time doing the stuff you actually want to do maybe that'll involve quitting your actual job and doing something different, maybe involve going part-time, maybe involve spending more time with your family and kids and stuff. Um, but but ha- having having that financial freedom is life-changing and passive income is one path on that route to financial freedom, which is ultimately on that route to living a happy, healthy, fulfilled life. <laughs> How do you think about wealth? Like, let's say that you're talking to someone you want to explain to them about wealth creation and what what it is. How do you think about that? Do you think about it in terms of you have a central job and then you try and peel cash off the top? What's the sort of basis? Um, I guess it's, for me, it's like, how much money do I need to live? And then how much money do I need to have a good life? Um, 
i.e. good life defined as doing the things that I want to, I want to do. For me personally, I don't think my lifestyle is particularly extravagant. Um, and therefore, you know, figure out what that, what that amount of money is. Usually the amount of money I need to live is different to the amount of money I would like to have in order to live a good, to, to live a good life. And then I just think we need to figure out a way of hitting those numbers. And for most people, that's their job. But the multiple income streams is another way of hitting those numbers. And for most people, what I usually advise is don't quit your job, like do your job. And then in the evenings and weekends, find ways to build these side hustles and projects that can make you money. So that in the future, if you want, you can quit your job if, you, if that's what you want. But, or you can go part time or you can continue doing it if you really enjoy it. But either way, it just gives you more freedom. It gives you more optionality. And certainly, like we, we found that in the pandemic, people lost their jobs and where you know, this black swan event happens that people can't imagine happening since like 1919 or whatever. Uh, people lose their jobs and you realize, oh my God, reliance on a single source of income is not a very anti-fragile way of living life, as they say. Um, and so multiple streams of passive income, whether it's through investments or through businesses or whatever, is a way of de-risking yourself. So that's sort of how I think about wealth. Like less so in the sort of construct of wealth, more in the case of how much money do I need to live? How much money do I need to live a good life? Does anyone need to sort anything before they start thinking about passive income? Is there any? Is there a step 0.5 before we start with step one? Mm. Um, probably not. I mean, I think the the issue with passive income is is actually yeah, most people need to start off with active income before they can switch to passive income. So you need to have some money coming in through something that you're doing. It is very hard to just conjure up a stream of passive income, passive defined as you're not you're not really working for it. I guess we, we can go into, in, in, into definitions, but I think active income, single stream, start with a single stream of income and then worry about like diversifying that into multiple streams. Cool. Stocks and shares. Where do you start? I don't know about stocks and shares. I don't know what to put my money in. Yep. I don't know what trading is. Where do I start? Okay. Uh, that leads us into a long conversation. Base, so practical advice, don't worry about it. Put money into, if you're in the UK, into a stocks and shares ISA which is a savings account, or in America, your Roth IRA or 401k. And if you can invest money, invest it into a stock market index fund. Uh, basically, what that means is that you are, instead of buying one company like Apple or Microsoft or Tesla or Google, you're buying a stake in the top 500 companies in, the, in America, which would just so happen, like if you put 100 quid in something called the S&P 500, um, three pounds would go to Apple and you'd own three pounds of Apple. Two pounds, you'd own two pounds of Alphabet A and B. So Google, you'd own two pounds of Microsoft, two pounds of Amazon and so on. And that means you can invest in the stock market without worrying about trying to cherry pick individual stocks, which doesn't work for anyone unless you're like a very, very, very professional hedge fund manager. And even then for those guys, picking stocks doesn't really work. So that would be my advice to people. Um, but I think it does help to have a first principles understanding of what the stock market is and, and how that kind of stuff works. I saw a video of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger giving an end of year address a oh, couple yeah. of years ago. And they were talking about, I think Warren had made a bet with a bunch of hedge fund managers to see if they could beat the S&P 500. Have you seen this video? Yep. <laughs> so sick. So, well, can you explain what happened and, and why that seems to be the case? Yeah. So the, the thing with, with funds Basically, if you're a rich person, you want you want you want your money to grow. You don't want if your money sits in a bank account or onto your mattress, it deflates over time because of inflation, because uh, the government prints more money, which gets us into a conversation about crypto and stuff, which we'll, we won't go down because I'm not very familiar with that space. Trying to understand it myself, but basically, money sitting on its own reduces its value over time, and therefore, if you have money, you want it to ideally increase its value over time. And one way you can do that, you can do it in real estate, or you can do it by buying and investing in stocks and shares. So you own a percentage of a company. If you do what, what, what I recommend and what, what Warren, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger recommends, I recommend you just invest in an index fund which tracks the whole stock market and you don't have to worry about it. But some people invest in actively managed funds. So that's basically, I would give you some money. I'd say, Chris, here is a million pounds. I want you to grow my million pounds. You would say, oh shit, Ali's giving me a million pounds. I need to grow it. But I need to do something other than just invest in the fund, in the index fund, right? Because I, I need to try and beat, beat the market. That's what beating the market means. And so you think, you know what? I think Tesla's going to do well. I think Netflix is going to well. I think, I think pets.com is going to do well. And I think, I don't know, Febreze is going to do well. I'm going to put a quarter of a million of Ali's money into those things. And I'm really going to hope that it outperforms what, what it would have done had I put it into just the top 500 companies in the US without thinking about it. And it apparently, according to Warren Buffett, I, I haven't read the research on this firsthand myself, but what Warren Buffett says and what a lot of advice on this industry is that 
the funds that do well one year, like let's say Chris's fund returns 20%. So my million goes to 1.2 million, whereas the S&P 500, the index market only returned 10%. So if I was average Joe investing in the index fund, I'd make 10%. But if I gave my money to you, Chris, I'd make 20%. Uh, but there's no guarantee that the next year, your fund is also making 20%. And there's also no guarantee that in year three, your fund is still doing well. And it turns out that there are very few funds, if any, that can actually just beat the market overall, which is what this bet was that Warren Buffett did with all these hedge fund managers, and he ended up winning it um, and giving the money to By charity. literally doing something that anybody could do pressing go all in on the S&P 500, which is in itself kind of a hedged type of investment because it's across so many different companies. And you're talking about professional hedge fund managers that were spending time and charging commissions and doing research and looking at, is this overpriced? What's the R number on the the Fibonacci sequence (laughs) over over trend, all this stuff. Exactly. Just put it in the S&P 500 and the S&P beat all of them. That's the one, yeah. I think I think there are some funds in the world, like especially the ones that invest in like early stage startups and things, where you probably do beat the market. But normal people don't have access to those. You have to be like ridiculously rich to be able to invest in those sorts of funds that do that kind of thing. Is my understanding. Therefore, most people should just invest in the S and P five hundred or a broad stock market index fund. In the UK and in the US, how would you do that? Um, in the UK, uh, basically, w- whichever country you're in, you need to get a. Um, a essentially a stockbroker. So back in the day, a stockbroker was some dude on Wall Street that you would ring up and say, hey, Tom, I want to put $20 on Apple. And he'd be like, all right, I'm placing that order. These days, stockbrokers are online. So you have these online stock trading platforms, and it varies between different countries. In the UK and the US and a bunch of countries in Europe, Vanguard is the most trusted. It was the original kind of index fund place. So you just open an account with Vanguard, and you put some money into it. Like, let's say you start with $10, $100, $1,000, whatever. And then you can allocate that money to one of these funds. And the one that I'm fully invested in is the S&P 500, which is just the 500 biggest companies in the US. I don't think too hard beyond it uh, about it beyond that. Um, So that's what I'd suggest. Just Google best online stockbroker. Hargreaves Lansdowne is quite popular in the UK. That's quite easy to set up. Yep. Uh, And you can tie that in. The allowance in the UK is £20,000 per year that you can put in tax-free. And the returns are also not taxed on that so over time that 20 will be 21 22 23 um so yes you can also set up a standing order slash direct debit which i think is a nice way to portion off a little bit of money Mm. every single month i know that x hundred pounds goes into that and it's also that also permits you to do what's called dollar cost averaging which is to piece into the market over time so the market's going to do these little wiggles wiggly wiggles up and down, hopefully trending upward, which means that you're continuing to earn money. But by piecing in consistently over multiple months, you don't end up ever catching too many big or too many low points within the market. And you get out of it on the other side, all right? No, exactly. So like I have a monthly standing order for £500 into the S&P 500 and uh, £2,000 into Bitcoin and Ethereum. (laughs) (laughs) Have you seen Coinbase has a smart investing thing? Oh, no, I haven't. What is that? So... Coinbase is a trading account that you can use. It's also a wallet for crypto. And they have a dollar cost averaging service mm. that uses the movement of the price to allocate how many, how much of your funds should go in. Oh. So let's say that you want to put, I want to put a thousand pounds into uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum every month. It will rate down or up how much it puts in of that thousand pounds based on the movement of the coin during that month. So if Bitcoin is more than 10% down, it'll put 1,400 in. Mm. But if Bitcoin is more than 10% up, it'll only put 600 in. So it actually sort of smart invests based on what the recent movement of the market has been. Oh, that's very sophisticated. I should try that out. I just use the recurring buy feature on Coinbase. Pretty cool. It's kind of like a rebalancing thing, but it happens automatically within the app. Oh, sick. And it's pretty simple when you think about it. It's like, has the price gone up a lot? okay, I'm not going to put quite so much in. Has the price gone down a lot? Okay, I'm going to put a little bit more in. Nice. Right, quite cool. Uh, Real estate or houses? Yes. (laughs) The thing with real estate is that um, it's it's a pretty good way of making passive income in that let's say you own a property and you rent it out to people and then they're paying you however much a month. I recently bought a property in Manchester, renting it out for about £1,000 a month, so making about £12,000 a year on, on the property. The issue with real estate, um, oh, and, and the other good thing about real estate is that you have a physical thing, right? Like, uh, no one's going to argue with, 
depending on which country you're in. No one's going to argue with the fact that you own that house. If you need to, you can live in the house. So whereas if you need to and you need to carry, you, you can't live in your 3% equity in Apple, like that's not really a thing. Uh, if you actually had 3% equity in Apple, you probably would be able to live in it. <laughs> like you're 0. 0.000003. Um, the, the, the issue with real estate is that you have to have a lot of money to get started with it. Like you need enough money for a deposit on a house. In the UK, if you want to do it as an investment, you need at least 25% of the purchase price. And if a house is 300K, you need 75K in cash to be able to afford that along with all the fees on top of it. And it's also not a very liquid asset class, meaning that it's very hard to get your money out of it because it's a ball ache to sell a house. Um, so if you need the money for whatever reason, you can't just click a button on Vanguard or on Hargreaves Lansdowne and click sell. You have to go through the rigmarole of trying to sell a house. There's fees on top of it. It's a nightmare. In a way, real estate is interesting because a lot of people, like probably in our parents' generation, got wealthy off of just buying a house and then not selling it. So real estate, like, it, it makes a lot of people accidentally good investors. Because the problem is, like, when something is very liquid, like, let's say your mom or let's say my mom were to invest in the S&P 500, she's probably the sort of person who'd be looking at that number every day and be like, oh, my God, I've just lost 100 pounds. I've just lost 200. And that would affect her emotionally. And therefore, she'd be tempted to hit the sell button. But obviously, like all these investments that we're talking about, these are long term investments, your money will always go up in the stock market over time, provided you don't sell at the wrong time. And the thing that real estate does is that it forces people to not sell because it's just too much effort. So <laughs> if you could, like, yeah, that's, that's kind of why real estate, real estate is good. And owning a house is kind of nice, because it just has all these hallmarks, which accidentally make it a good investment. It's so effortful that it locks you into holding onto the trade for so long that exactly. it actually works. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I think that you're right. What we've got <clears throat> at the beginning here is probably one of the easiest to put money into in terms of stocks and shares, some sort of passive cash, uh, stocks and shares ISA in the UK with Hargreaves Lansdowne, where you could literally do £30 a month. Yep. And then the other end of the scale, which is something which is quite cash capital prohibitive, which is buying a house. In the UK, 25% down. Mm. I would budget 30% overall, which would include fees, Stamp duty, yep. solicitors, arrangements, surveys, uh, and maybe a little bit of work, uh, yeah. a little bit more. You want to paint this wall. I want to get some photos done, whatever it might be. To give my experience with this, I've just completed on my fifth house, which is all the same, 25% down uh, on a buy to let, an interest only mortgage, which means that I'm not putting any more equity into the house. However, it does mean that I get more cash. It's a, a vehicle for generating cash for me. That's what I'm concerned about. So I don't want to pay any more into the mortgage than I need to. I don't want to put equity into the bricks of the building on top of the 25% that's already there. Yep. What I want to do is just pay off what I need to to the bank in order to keep a hold of the house. Then the rent that comes in from the tenants, I want to clear off as much of that as I can over the top. Yep. Now, I self-managed all of my properties up until this year and then moved over to going managed this would be choosing a letting agent to be the person that the tenants ring when the boiler breaks mm. or when they snap a chair or when they've locked themselves out or when they have a dispute about you've charged us for cleaning when we moved out and I don't want to. I think overall, if you're considering getting into property and if you're looking to do a buy to let, I think it's a good idea to self-manage at least mm. for a year. Okay. Reason being, this is going to be a significant portion of your net worth that's tied up in these houses you are going to have conversations with the people that manage those properties and you want to know what they're talking about. You want to know what the DPS is. You want to understand about the local licenses that occur within where, wherever it is that you are buying. This is also another reason for, I think, purchasing bulks of properties within one place. Find a place that has a relatively good yield and buy everything in that. Yeah, if you want to go and get holiday homes and sort of play around with things for Airbnb, then maybe you could do it that way. But I think that there will be individual licensing quirks. In Newcastle, there's this strange uh, C4, C3 personal license HMO system that the council's got in place. It doesn't exist anywhere else. One of the first cities that's got it in all of the UK. You need to learn that. If I decide to now go to Manchester and the council has a different rating system, I've got to learn it all over again because I need to work out mm. that should I be purchasing whatever, whatever. So you can actually uh, reduce the skill acquisition or the knowledge acquisition overheads by choosing to learn one area once and then just digging a bunch of money into that. Uh, if you want to look at places to purchase, I would advise ideally near to where you are. It means that you can go and deal with the letting agents one-on-one. -on -one. You can have conversations with them. If there's problems with the tenants, you can go and deal with them. 
Other than that, if you are prepared, if you're somewhere that's very expensive, like London, that doesn't have fantastic yields, just go on right move and look at the places that have the biggest yields. I think Nottingham came back as number one this year. Mm. There's places, um, I want to say Bournemouth was one of them. Swansea was one of them. Newcastle, Manchester. A lot of them are student towns. So <clears throat> that would be an overarching theme. Another thing that I would say, more bedrooms is better. Mm. Like just get as many bedrooms as you can. In fact, the way that I try and look at the property purchases is how much is the cost per bedroom of this house? Yep. So I can get in Newcastle a three bed for around about 120, but I can get a five bed for about 150. Mm. So I try, if I can, to get higher bedroom properties because they're going to yield more. And that means that you have to wait longer until you get them. But yeah, those are the two ends of the spectrum. I think we've got stocks and shares, put as little in as you need. And then we've got houses, quite a lot of, of capital. Yes. What is your... Well, in fact, actually, capital gains is something that we haven't spoken about yet. Mm which happens with the properties. Yeah. So if, again, it kind of varies depending on which country you're in, but usually there is some some level of tax that you get when you dispose of an asset. So if you sell a house and the house has made money relative to how much it was when you bought it, and it is not the house that you live in, i.e. it's a rental property, then you have to pay the government some amount of tax. I think it's like 20% uh, for basic taxpayers and... Was it 10%? I can't remember exactly what the number is. It but that's only of the increase in the property's value, right? Of the increase, yeah, of how much extra money you made on it. And in the UK, you have like a £10,000 a year capital gains allowance. Uh, that's why if you're investing in stocks and shares, doing it through an ISA, an individual savings account, I think that's what it stands for, is useful because ISAs are always tax-free. And so, for example, if you put in 20000 like right now, and 30 years down the line, it had grown to, I don't know, £120,000, but if, if, if it was within the context of an ISA, you wouldn't pay any tax on that 120K. But if it wasn't, you'd end up being taxed on the £100,000 of gain you'd made on it, and you'd be losing twenty to 40000 to the government in, mm-hmm. in tax. Mm-hmm. So ISAs are very useful for that reason. That's another thing. It's a hedge. Uh, having a property is a hedge against inflation, right? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, people often say that. So th- the nice thing about properties is that if inflation is very high, it means actually that your mortgage is getting cheaper <laughs> because you're still paying the same amount of money back to the bank, theoretically, unless you have a, a variable rate mortgage. But let's say you've got a fixed rate mortgage, which is fixed at... In America, they fix them for like 30 years. In the UK, they fix them for like up to, up to five years usually. <laughs> yeah. So let's say your mortgage is fixed at like an interest rate of 2% for five years. And then inflation goes up to 10%, you know, God forbid. You're still paying just... 2% extra, um, 2% uh, each year. And so the value of the money, the, the money that you have borrowed to buy the house, it becomes less valuable. Uh, and therefore, you're essentially paying off your house by default because of inflation. Also, usually the price of houses, the value of the house tends to increase greater than the rate of inflation in any case. So you will earn money presumably on the house's value increasing over time. Yep. Housing market only goes up, someone said once. <laughs> and... Yeah, that ends up with you hedging against inflation yeah. whilst having a capital gains vehicle yeah. that earns cash in the moment and also potentially earns you more cash when you come to sell it at the end. Yeah, the, the, that's, that's another thing that's nice about real estate. Uh, s- similar to some stocks, uh, you make money through the value of the stock price increasing, but you also make money through some companies paying dividends to their shareholders. So I don't know, if you invest in Coca-Cola or something, you might make a few tens of pounds <laughs> each quarter when they, when they, when they put out dividends. Similarly, with real estate, you, you, could make more, you could make money when you sell it 10 years down the line because the value is increased, but you're also making money each month because people are paying you rent. So it's pretty nice. But it really is a vehicle for which the, the rich get rich. <laughs> it's such a Matthew yeah. principle, man. Yeah, it like, really is. And yeah. I, see this, I see this within my own experience. So it took me, from finishing uni, it took me four years to buy my first house. And then it took me two years to buy my second and then one year to buy my third and then six months to buy my fourth. So there is just this perfect parabolic. Is that it? Exponential. Exponential, Something like that. Yeah. Just this perfect line coming back in. Yeah. And um, yeah, you you see it happen in front of your own eyes. Mm. You really do. Uh, All right. YouTube. How do people make money on YouTube? Oh, so many different ways. Uh, the most obvious one is YouTube AdSense or Google AdSense. Those five second ads that play before videos, maybe like this one, if people are watching it on, on, on YouTube and on average, people will make roughly $2, $1.50 per thousand views. So if this video gets a thousand views, you'll be making $2. Nicely done. Um, but also there are people, YouTubers can make money through sponsorships. So you've got a bunch of sponsorships on your show. Um, and roughly, you can expect to be making very, very roughly $15 per thousand views on a sponsorship. 
So again, let's say this video, let's say your videos on average get 100,000 views. You can probably make $1,500 through a sponsor that would be, will pay $1,500 for you to plug their Huel or whatever, Skillshare, Audible, Squarespace, blah, 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 um, to your 100,000 viewers. So those are kind of the two main ways to make money off of YouTube. There's all these other extra bits like super chat and like subscriptions and stuff, which is a very, a very small part of it. Um, but really the way YouTubers make the big bucks isn't through Google ads or through brand deals, particularly is usually through creating their own products, which they, they can then sell to their audience. Yes. Before we get onto that podcasts are pretty much the same. You've got this episode is brought to you by that happens beforehand. Now we've gone from two very passive forms of income into podcasts and YouTube, which is significantly more active. Yeah. So this is more for someone that actually wants a legit side hustle. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, it sort of depends how you define passive income. Like, in a way, the way I view YouTube videos is that a YouTube video is also an asset. And an asset is something that puts money in your pocket, whereas a liability or an investment is something that puts money in your pocket. A liability is something that takes money away from your pocket. And so if I put in three hours into making a YouTube video, that YouTube video is sitting on the platform forever and it's making me money while I'm sleeping. That's pretty cool. Um, in, in fact, uh, most of my YouTube videos will perform better than the house that I've just bought as a rental property because they make more money per month than someone pays in rent. Oh, I wouldn't say most, uh, but like rel- relative to the amount of effort it was to make the video and the amount of money I put into the property, my yield on a YouTube video or an online course is so much higher than my yield on buying buying a house, which is kind of weird, weird when you think about it. But yeah, YouTube videos, podcast episodes, podcast episodes are not so much because you like get the money as a one-off, as a brand deal, unless they happen to be on YouTube where you're making the ads as well. But it's kind of like anytime you make a video, it's like you've just bought a rental property and that video is working for you and giving you rent every single month. Yes. Digital products. You've said that this is one of the ways that online creators that build up an audience can monetize more effectively. Yeah. So um, digital products are a subset of products generally, i.e. selling, selling stuff. And the two broad ways you can sell, sell, sell stuff, and this is like, you know, it's how they phrase it in UK law. You either sell goods or you sell services. Now, let's say I, I could sell you a service, Chris. I could sell you the service of, I don't know, personal training, you know, because you obviously need to <laughs> need a personal trainer. I can provide you personal training as a service. You can pay me for my time in giving you in giving you personal training as a service. Now, if it just so happened that I built an audience based off of fit, health and fitness content, then there are some people in my audience who might want to pay me to be their personal trainer. That's me selling a service to someone. Alternatively, I could sell goods. And within goods, I could sell physical goods or digital goods. Physical goods would be a YouTuber saying, hey, buy my merch, buy my t-shirt, buy my mug. And they'd make 7, 10, 20, 30 pounds on a t-shirt or a mug. And some of their audiences, some of their audience would buy the physical product. I think the most interesting form is digital products. I think it's more interesting than services and more interesting than physical goods. A digital product is someone, someone like Peter McKinnon, a f- photography, videography YouTuber saying, Hey, buy my Lightroom presets. Or it's someone like August Bradley saying, Hey, buy my online course or buy my notion template or buy my website template or buy my icon pack. And there are people that have made millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions off the back of selling digital products. And the great thing about digital products is that you generally you make it once and then it costs you no extra money or time to give it out to sell it to five people as it does to sell it to five million people. Whereas if I want to sell five people a shirt, I have to manufacture, produce and sell, you know, manage five shirts. If I want to sell five million shirts, I need to get a whole warehouse. I need to get a whole, it's, it's a real nightmare selling five million shirts and it eats into your margins. It's a, it's a big household. <coughs> it's not at all a nightmare to sell five million copies of a website template. That's like free money, basically. The scalability on the internet is a sight to behold. Other things that people have may have seen would be something like a workout plan, a one-off workout plan. That is different to having a course or a membership service that gives you workouts regularly. Mm. So you can write up a PDF. Let's say that you're a PT. You decide to write up 30 days of EMOM workouts or 30 days of uh, high-intensity workouts, whatever it might be. That can exist on the internet. Let's say that someone has some sort of speciality and they think, I want to teach people to they're a positive psychologist and they want to give someone a guide to the principles of positive psychology in a little ebook or something mm. like that. How would you list it and sell it in the most frictionless way? Um, probably a website called Gumroad. That's, actually, I've got the, the, the guy who invented Gumroad. I've got his book there. Um, so Hill Lavingia. Yeah. 
He was supposed to be on the podcast this Wednesday, but we've had to rearrange. Oh, nice. I yeah, I haven't read the book yet. It, it, it literally arrived earlier today as a advanced copy. So we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. see how that is. Uh, but Gumroad is great. You make an account and you can just sell stuff. And they charge like a, I don't know, 2% commission on But they'll host it. Yeah. It'll look nice. It'll be all pre-done. You don't it's need so to learn to how to code. Exactly. You just put a link on your YouTube description. It takes three seconds to list a product from Gumroad. And then you can just literally start making money. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Online courses. Online courses. Online courses are an interesting class of digital products because if you're a nerd and you're teaching something to your audience, um, generally, okay, so if we take a step back, generally there's like, uh, the you can split up content into entertainment content or educational content. And for people like you and me who are doing educational rather than entertainment content, no offense, um, our audience is primed to think of us as teachers. And therefore, if we were to make an online course teaching the same stuff that we teach on our YouTube channels, maybe in a bit more depth, maybe with a bit more structure, then the audience of our YouTube channel is primed to be also interested in, oh, I wonder, I, w- I, w- I want to hear Chris teach me about passive income. I want to hear Chris teach me about his morning routine. I want to hear Chris teach me about how to launch a podcast because he's done well with the whole podcast thing. And the nice thing about an online course, again, is that you just record it once. If it's a kind of self-paced online course, you put the videos up online on a website like Podia, which is my favorite, or Teachable, or there's all these different platforms where you pay a small fee, like $29 a month. But they host your product, they handle the payment, they handle the checkout page, they handle the forgot password, user login. You don't need to learn to code or anything. You just literally upload your videos. And then within a minute, you can start selling an online course to your audience. And online courses are how I've made the bulk of my money over the last like 10 years. Passive online courses, but also this new class, which you've capitalized on, which is cohort-based online courses. What's the difference there? Yeah, so we've got passive online courses, which is the, uh, the, the traditional thing you might expect from an online course. You sign up, you pay maybe a few tens or a few hundreds of dollars, and then you've got this library of videos that you can watch through at your own pace. Basically, a passive online course is glorified YouTube videos just in a structure with a paywall behind it. This is really convenient. It's very convenient for the creator because they just have to record them once. It's quite convenient for the viewer because they can watch it at their own pace. Self-paced, yeah. Exactly. It's like with Netflix. You can watch a whole season in one go if you really want to. You don't have to wait for the next episodes to come out. The issue with online courses, is passive online courses, is that they have a famously low completion rate. Like I've signed up to dozens of online courses that I've never even once opened or watched the first two lessons and I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered to do this anymore. That's what most people are like. Like I think 2% optimistically is the completion rate of like a generic passive online course. And so there are people who have been like, okay, online courses benefit from the scale of the internet. But if you're really thinking about offering a transformation to your students, they're unlikely to get it through a passive online course unless they are particularly self-motivated. So now there's this whole new vibe of online courses uh, that they call cohort-based courses, which is sort of actually mimicking the way that like real life education is done. Like when you sign up to do a degree, you aren't signing up for an online course that you can watch at your own pace. Although, depending on what degree you do, that ends up being ends up being the case, and you end up teaching yourself. Depends if there's the a pandemic or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, to be honest, even pre-pandemic, most of my med school teaching was through YouTube videos. <laughs> um, but that aside, you know, you're paying a large amount of money. You're you're getting this experience. You're part of a cohort. You're part of a community of people. You're getting these live lectures. You're getting these workshops, these tutorials, these supervisions. And at the end of it, you get some sort of skill, some sort of qualification, some sort of you become a doctor maybe if you're doing if you're doing medicine. A live cohort online course is trying to do the same thing, just doing it over Zoom rather than in real life. So I run one called the Part-Time YouTuber Academy. You're thinking of maybe starting below. Yeah, oh, thank you. Where every three months we run a new cohort. It lasts for somewhere between four and six weeks. We change it up depending on how we're feeling. And twice a week, I rock up to a Zoom call. I teach people for two hours for live sessions. And then we have a bunch of interactive things. We have a bunch of like small group teaching sessions. That's a lot of work. It means we can charge more for it. So we charge at the moment between $1,500 and $5,000 per place. It's still way cheaper than a similar course would be in real life, but it's way more expensive than a passive online course would be. But hopefully it's good for students who can afford it because they recognize that it's, it's sort of like you don't need a personal trainer to work out. But and, and, you, and you definitely could get henched by yourself by following an online workout plan or just doing it yourself. But for a lot of us who don't have a lot of time on our hands, who don't rate our own motivation or accountability very high, having a personal trainer is really, really helpful. Similarly, you could do a course passively online. And if, you've, if you're self-motivated enough to get the value from it, then that's fantastic. But I think where live cohorts benefit is in the accountability and the community that you get around it, not so much the content, which makes people do the thing more. Because often the barrier between, you know, if you think about, say, if, if you're listening to this and you've been wanting to start a YouTube channel or a podcast, the reason you haven't yet is not a lack of information. The information, is like I, I hold my hands and say, is it's all freely available on the internet. 
The reason you haven't is because you haven't got that push, you haven't got the accountability, you haven't got that community. So that's what you're paying for in a live cohort course. So I'd recommend you should start one. It shows, I think, the importance of compliance, Mm. that if you get someone to actually comply to the things that you do, the vast majority of people are going to see results. And what you get is this feeling of discomfort when you do a cohort-based course, especially if you have tasks that are supposed to be handed in each week. So with yours, you have... All I want you to do by the end of this course is recorded a YouTube video every single week. And you see other people are posting and you go, oh God, God, I haven't done my YouTube video yet. So yeah, there's there's an interesting, I'm sure that someone's probably created a matrix of the amount of work that it takes for the creator and the amount of money that you can get back from the customer in terms of this. Yeah. It is more effortful to do a cohort-based course, significantly more. It's more time consuming, but also the amount that you can charge and the results that you get for the customer are higher. Yeah. If you have a single delivery digital product that is literally a one and done, if you have a passive consumption for an online course, there's usually some form of community sometimes alongside that, yeah. like some sort of Facebook group or something or circle where you can go and do that. Um, I think that with those particular areas of skill sets, you really, I'm am I right in thinking that you probably need to aim at building an audience organically with something like a podcast or YouTube or Instagram before you then try and launch a course, like just launching a course off your own back, posting it on your Twitter to your thousand followers and hoping that someone buys might be a poor way to invest your time. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a, a bit of nuance here. So I think a passive online course, if you have a small audience, is not really worth very much because if you think, if you have a thousand followers on Twitter, Maybe if you're really lucky, 10% of them will buy your course. More, more realistically, 1%. So let's say 10 people, 1% of your audience buys your course. And let's say you charge, I don't know, $100 for your course. You're making $1,000, which is, which is good money, but it, pro- it probably took you like a large amount of time to put this course together. Now let's say you have the same 1,000 followers on Twitter and they are following you because they know you tweet about this one very specific thing. And you create a live cohort online course on it about the thing. And let's say, I don't know, 0.5%, so less than that. Let's say 0.5% of your customers decide to buy the thing, but you're charging $2,000 for it instead. Now you can have this like very very intimate experience with these this very small group of people that knows, likes, and trusts you already. They want your expertise on the topic, and they're happy to pay you $2,000 for it. So in fact, if you sell five of them, you've made $10,000. And if you do that a few times a year, you've made a full-time living off the back of 1,000 Twitter followers, provided the value you're providing is specific enough for people to want to pay for. So... I think in the old school model of like passive stuff, passive courses, it very much is the case that you should build the audience first and monetize the audience second. But I think you actually can monetize an audience that's quite quite small if you want to through the back of a coaching program or a live live cohort course. I still wouldn't recommend it. I still think, as Gary Vaynerchuk would say, it's better to put your effort into growing the audience before you try and monetize it. But When do you know when you've grown the audience enough? Uh, the way I think of it is like, at what point, if I monetize my audience now, would it be an interesting amount of money that would change my life in some capacity? So if I had 100 people in my audience and I was making $10 a month, it's not worth it. If I'm making $100 a month, it's not worth it. If I'm making $1,000 a month, uh, it depends what stage of you of life you're, life you're at. But when I was younger, $1,000 a month for me would have been sufficiently game-changing to warrant doing the monetization. Whereas $100 a month, uh, it's it means I can get an extra few takeaways. It, do, it, it doesn't add anything meaningful to my life. So that's how I kind of think about it. Um, I'm sure there are other other frameworks as well. I was talking to you earlier on about fitness mm. and some of the ways that people monetize in the fitness industry. They really have turned this up to 11. The one thing that they haven't got a hold of yet are cohort-based courses. Mm. So no one really in the fitness industry, as far as I'm aware, uh, apart from fit pros teaching other fit pros to make digital products, yep. that is one that has because they're so far ahead of the curve. But no one's really got into transformation cohort-based courses in the way that I think you quite can yet. They'll bundle people together and say, begin this, and in six weeks' time, we'll all post our progress photos. Yeah. But it's just not quite the same because the consumption of the product that you're doing is inherently in the real world as opposed to in the digital world. Yeah. So going through it together, it's like, oh, today's workout was hard, but you weren't there. You know I mean, yeah. it wasn't like I didn't watch you do yours and you didn't watch me do mine. But certainly PTs that are out there, and there will be a lot of people that are PTs that are listening or work in gyms, you have a captive audience. Mm. They're the people that you train week in, week out. You have maybe 30 clients, 40 clients perhaps that you deal with every single month. They are people that you can monetize off the back of. If you want to write a nutrition guide, if you want to do whatever, you could even offer it to new clients as a bonus for them coming on. You could sell it to old clients that have lapsed. 
that I think that it's just a nice way, especially if you have expertise mm. in an area, it's such a nice and easy way to just add a little bit of extra money on. That being said, it is effortful. You're going to have to write it. Um, Gumroad for digital products. Teachable, Podia, Kajabi for online, online courses. courses. Yep. Cohort-based courses. Has anyone got that platform right yet? Uh, there's lots of companies trying to build it. There's one called Virtually that we, we sort of use. Uh, another one called Coleap, which is run by some friends of mine. No one's quite got it fully right yet. Uh, people are working on it. We use a combination of Virtually, Google Sheets, Zapier, Zoom. It's a bit of a janky setup that's duct taped. Everyone that I know yeah. that does <laughs> cohort-based courses has this super village, like cottage industry yep. cable tied together. Yep. Just using <laughs> if this then that framework exactly. and Zapier yeah. to hold desperately try and hold exactly. the business yeah. together. Circle and Vimeo, that kind <laughs> yeah. of stuff. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah. Uh, affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing. Uh, the idea here is that instead of selling your own product, you're selling someone else's product and you're getting a percentage commission. So the biggest affiliate program in the world is Amazon Associates. Basically, anyone can sign up to be an affiliate for Amazon. So that let's say you do a video reviewing, I don't know, the latest Sony camera and you put an Amazon affiliate link in the video description. If someone buys the product through your affiliate link, you make maybe somewhere between a 1% and 3% commission, which if they're paying $3,000 for a camera is actually not bad. That's at, you know, 30 to $90, I think, if my maths is right. If they're paying $4.99 for a Kindle ebook, you have to sell a lot of them to make any decent money off of that. So that's how affiliate programs work. Amazon gives you very low commissions, like broadly, broadly speaking. But if you can partner up with uh, individual brands, uh, I work with a company called Paperlike, a keyboard company called IQ Unix. Uh, at that point, you can negotiate things like 10%, 20%, 30%, sometimes even 50% affiliate commissions off of the things that you sell. And it doesn't have to be just digital products or physical products. It can also be online courses. So I'm an affiliate for like my friend Pat Flynn's and Tiago Forte and David Perel's online courses. We've got a bunch of affiliates for our course. It's generally like a win-win way of selling someone else's product that you believe in that your audience will then be more likely to buy because you've recommended it and you get a percentage of you you get a commission on it it's it's like it's like being a salesman but in on the internet yeah well i mean everyone believes in something there are all things that we rate Hmm. i rate my mate's barber's shop because that's where i go and i know that he'll look after your hair i rate that club night man you're going out on a thursday you should go to this particular place all that we're talking about here is formalizing that agreement and getting a bit of a kickback i think affiliate marketing in some circles kind of gets a bit of a bad name because it creates a perverse incentive for someone to oversell you on what kind of sounds like a personal recommendation. But that being said, well, I mean, that identifies why it's such a low amount of commission that Amazon sells you or Mm. offers you because you could sell anything. The fact is that everybody needs something and they're probably going to get it on Amazon. And if you're the intermediary, what have you done? Like, what were you there for? It was either the Oral-B Diamond White or (laughs) the Philips Sonicare. (laughs) And you just happened to direct them one way or the other. You haven't actually brought any trade here. Um, It's funny that you talk about if you managed to sell someone on an expensive product versus on a bunch of Kindles. I have got affiliate links in all of the ebooks that I've released. So mm. the life hacks list and in the uh, reading list as well, both of which have got all tracked Amazon links, which I just thought would be interesting and it's passive oh, yeah. income. So why not? And I looked, it took a long time to write the uh, 100 books reading list and the entire amount of all of that income has topped up to about 12 pounds nice. i think because it's you're talking about three pounds kindles yeah. some of them are free yeah some people have got audible subscriptions so they're just using it on their audible which means that i don't yeah. get anything yeah and then one guy because you can actually track um what product brought people to amazon on mm. your amazon affiliates back end what brought people to amazon and then what did they what did they buy downstream from that yeah and this one guy bought a ps5 oh, so some yes. dude went on to buy the almanac of naval ravikant and yeah. then bought a ps5 i was like yes like Ten pounds fifty, and that was that was like the big earner for the for the year. Solid, yeah, so funny, man. But um, yeah, are there any other affiliate marketing, easy access affiliate marketing uh, platforms or mm. sections that you think people should take advantage of? Yeah, I think if you if you have an audience and you have a product or an online thing that that you like, uh, the first thing I would do is Google have they got an affiliate program. So like the other day, I was thinking, I started watching some masterclasses. Malcolm Gladwell's writing masterclass. I was like, oh, I wonder if masterclass have an affiliate program. So I typed in masterclass affiliate program. And then I found that they've got some, uh, it, it seemed like it was active some of the time and not active some of the time. 
Um, the other option is if they don't have an affiliate program you can easily sign up to is you can just email them and say, hey, have you got an affiliate program? Yeah. And I've had success in companies setting up an affiliate program just for me. For you. Because I emailed them. Because, <laughs> But like, where I could say, look, I really like this keyboard. I'm pretty sure I can drive a lot of traffic to your keyboard. Can you please make an affiliate program? Here's what I'd recommend. And they're like, after a few months, yeah, all right. And then it works. <laughs> so you can do surprising things like that that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Yeah, it's... um. It is funny. It is funny how you're able to make money online in that way by directing people around the internet. I suppose that what a lot of these are coming back to is that you need to have a trusted network of people yeah. who are coming to you, who believe what you say, mm. who have faith in your word. Have you got any suggestions for how people, creators online, should improve their trust with their audience? Yeah. Yeah, that's the tricky thing because... You know what they say is it's like, you know, it takes a lifetime to build up and like an instant to lose. And I've certainly done it a few times where we've put out a video where uh, it was kind of because we just had a sponsor deadline coming up and I didn't really stand by the value of the video, but we put it out anyway. And A, that always feels really bad for me, but also people can tell like, oh, this is, this was a throwaway video. This wasn't the usual quality. And really, I think trust is built up by showing up regularly and by delivering, delivering value. Um, the way Gary Vaynerchuk puts it is like anytime you give someone something for free, like valuable content for free, you're adding to the goodwill bank bank balance with that person. And anytime you try and sell them something, generally you're you're withdrawing from that bank of goodwill. And so he advocates a strategy of he he calls it jab 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 right hook, where a jab is giving someone really valuable content for free, and a right hook is asking them to buy something from you. And he famously says that if he, like he's, he's written a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. But he says that if he could, he would have named it Jab, 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 like 20 <laughs> times before the right hook. Because that is the ratio of how much you should be helping people out with free valuable content compared to asking them for the sale. Um, but he wasn't allowed to name it that because the publishers didn't You end him. up with latent leverage, which is what Jack Butcher calls it. The fact that you have all of this goodwill that's built up and built up and built up, and then you finally ask people for something. Yep. So when the life hacks list released last year, my convert kit got shut down because on the first day that we launched it, we mm. did 5,000 email addresses and they presumed that I'd bugged something or i'd broken something wow. and i had to actually get in touch with the coo on twitter yeah. to say dude i'm driving a lot of people to this landing page can yeah. you please get them to reactivate it yeah. and he gave me a call actually he was really really kind and said oh really really sorry congratulations on the launch it's obviously gone well yeah. um but that what that taught me was that i'd left it too long before i'd started capturing email addresses okay. from my audience yeah. because if i had so much latent leverage sat there three years nearly 200 episodes of a podcast or yeah. more um and I'd only just started asking them for, even that was free. Even yeah. that was me still adding value. I just wanted yeah. an email address in return. That kind of made me think, okay, um, I, I probably could have done this a little bit sooner. Mm. And that's an interesting thing to consider yeah. that you can wait too long to do this too. And yeah, jumping, uh, finding the right balance. I think when you've built up sufficient goodwill, a good place to start must be to build an email list because that is a halfway house. Exactly. Yeah. So, the way a lot of online marketing funnels work, it's like you have people coming in through your website or through your YouTube channel or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and you want to get them onto an email list because you don't really own that audience, in inverted commas. You don't really own that audience when it's on someone else's platform. YouTube owns the audience or TikTok owns the audience. But you do really own that audience when you have an email list. Like when you have someone's email address, you're, they're giving you permission to show up in their inbox, assuming you don't get spam filtered by Gmail or, or whatever. Um, and so really the first step and once you know almost from day one it's sensible to start building an email list and it's a very easy thing to do you've got your email newsletter which is fantastic and Thank it's you. just you, you know you're 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 delivering value week after week um where people have signed up to hear from you and therefore maybe once a year when you launch a product you can email that list being like hey guys i'm launching this thing do you want to buy it here's a link and those people are primed to buy from you because that you've been showing up in their inbox building up your trust with them week after week for for a long period of time yeah yeah that's a good one uh what would you use? What would you advise someone to use? Let's say that they think I, I have a little bit of an audience. I want to start building an email list. Mm. What's the easiest, most frictionless way to do that? Ooh, uh, a few different platforms these days. So Substack and Review are free. Review is actually built into Twitter. So I, I actually had my email list on Review for like three years before I moved it to ConvertKit. Um, so Review is what I'd recommend. R E V U E. Um, once you're ready to take email marketing a bit more seriously, uh, you can switch to something like ConvertKit. 
uh, which is very good, but it is quite expensive. Uh, so after your first thousand subscribers, which are free. So I'd, st- I'd start with review or Substack. Yeah, uh, the thing I like about review is it's got on your Twitter account, especially if you're big on Twitter, it's got a subscribe yep. right there at the top of your Twitter profile. Yep. Um, what I would say, I hope review aren't watching this, uh, what I've done is I've just set up my review yep. at the top and I just pull the emails across every day into convert yeah, or every one, once, <laughs> once a week so yeah, you can take advantage of the frictionless sign up yes on twitter but then pull them across into your main convert kits yeah that's what we do we we, we, we use a zap for that as well <laughs> oh you're gonna have to send me that yeah anytime, so you can automate it yeah anytime someone signs up to review you can you can just make a zap in three seconds that sends adds them as a convert kit subscriber that's sick okay yeah. i didn't know about that uh membership membership sites membership sites so the idea here is that um you get some of your audience, you charge them a monthly membership fee and bring them into some sort of premium offering. Patreon is one example of a membership site uh, where the vibe of Patreon is, hey, support my work for $5 a month and in return you'll get early access to my videos or you'll get a a live Q&A with me every month. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk often says that if someone is your super fan, the thing they'll pay for is more access to you. So more of your content, more of your behind the scenes, that kind of stuff. Um, That's one way of doing a membership thing. And the nice thing about memberships is that people will pay you monthly, so you've got recurring income. The annoying thing about memberships is that you do then have to be showing up every single month to provide value, otherwise it's a bit unfair. And so actually, I tried to do a membership thing with my YouTuber Academy. We called it the Inner Circle, which was afterwards for alumni, charging $50 to $100 a month. Uh, And we had like weekly events going on, and we we, we, we had a lot of activities. But even with weekly events, and sometimes twice weekly events, I still felt we weren't providing enough value. Uh, compared to the ridiculous amount of value we provide in the course and so we ended up canceling it after six months and just refunding everyone any money they'd ever paid which was like one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of refunds that we did but it was for the sake of that trust because i was like no there's no way it 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 wasn't fair for us to like i wouldn't I, i i didn't feel good about charging people for that value that we were offering so patreon is one way to do a membership you can build your own membership site using something like ghost which is what i use for my personal website which is very good um there's a few other options like paid newsletters on substack um, you can get people in through YouTube page subscriptions, which is built into YouTube, uh, where you can get them into a Discord community. There's all sorts of different ways of doing membership content. But the idea is that some of your fa- some of your audience will be happy to pay a certain amount of money each month. But if you if you're if you want to be in kind of integrity about it, you want to give them decent amounts of value every month. Yeah, so it you is can't you can't just put people into a group and hope for the best. So yeah. locals, which is the platform that I've just started using. One of the reasons that I really like that over Patreon, and I've vacillated for ages and ages thinking, <clears throat> do I want to use Patreon? Do I want to go with Locals? Now, I ended up choosing Locals mostly because it permits inter-community bonding. Yes. So community members can post in there. They can have discussions between themselves. Every day that an episode goes up, there's a thread talking about it. Yeah. Whereas Patreon, because it's established and there's, there's an expected uh, modus operandi on there, it's here is a new piece of content for you. Enjoy. Here is a new piece of content for you. Watch. Here is a, whatever, like a little update or something. It doesn't feel as organic and natural. So Locals for me felt like a really, really good platform choice. There's another platform that's owned by Patreon. Owned by Patreon. And it's, I think it's called Memberful. Oh, yes. That paywalls, yeah, paywalls WordPress sites. So let's say that you've got a WordPress site that you want to have some work behind a paywall on it. And they can integrate that. I think there's a way that they can actually integrate those member lists with mm. some other some other fancy things through Zapier or yeah. through IFTTT. And um, yeah, that would be interesting. Why, do, why didn't you go for Patreon plus Discord? Uh, I wanted everything to be in one okay. site. Uh, I also think that Discord itself as a platform is a very particular portion of the internet yep. that understands what Discord is, knows how to use it, and although most people would be adaptable, mm. I felt like Locals was just such a frictionless, it's built for conversions. It's built for creators. Yep. You click on the link, there is a big button that says join, yep. email, super, password, super easy, sign yeah. up, click the confirmation and you're in. It's got and a nice it's, photo of you as well. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Be- <laughs> yeah. Be- beautiful photo, the Popeye, Popeye arms. Yeah. Someone accused me of looking like, who was that guy from Fast and Furious that died? Oh, I can't remember his name. Paul, Paul Walker. Someone. Yeah. A cross between Paul Walker and Popeye, which I took as a... That's a, a compliment. I took as a compliment, yeah. but it might not have been. Uh, automating a business. What's that mean? Automating a business. Um, a good reading on this is Tim Ferriss's 4-Hour Workweek, which uh, kind of, I guess, put this, this idea on the map. But basically, if you have a business, let's say, I don't know, you're... Let's say you're selling a physical product. 
let's say I'm selling a t-shirt. That, that actually is more like a traditional business than an online business. Like even if I take orders online, I still have to fulfill the orders. I have to figure out a way of like, you know, getting the customer size, getting a payment from the customer, um, printing the t-shirt they want printed or getting it shipped from my warehouse to their address, tracking the fact that it's shipped to their address, making sure they're happy with it, making some, having someone monitor the support inbox because if they email me for whatever reason, I need to be able to reply to them, having someone deal with refunds if for, for whatever reason their t-shirt didn't arrive. There's a lot of stuff associated with that. Now, if, you run a, if you're trying to do this all yourself, it ends up taking a large amount of time and you realize, hang on, I, if I want to scale this business, I don't have enough hours in the day to be able to manually package up and ship out all my orders. And therefore, you can start adding ways, you can delegate and automate aspects of your business. So bits that you can delegate is you could theoretically hire someone to manage your support inbox, or you could hire someone to ship the orders from the warehouse. Um, a way you can automate it is you can create, you can use something like Zapier to say that, okay, whenever a customer places an order, I want it to automatically send an email to my warehouse person to say, hey, someone has placed an order. That means I don't have to send them a WhatsApp message anymore. When a customer emails our support inbox, I want it to automatically send a ping to our Slack channel, which my support person is handling, so they can get, they, they, can, they can reply to the message immediately. If someone sends us an email with the word refund in it, I want it to automatically just refund them on Stripe or PayPal without even me having to think about it because I don't really care. There's all these different things you can do to automate and delegate aspects of your business, which is ultimately what you need to do to scale because your own time as a business owner is limited to 24 hours in a day. And as a business owner, you can probably do more valuable things than reply to refund requests or or things like that. So this is about freeing up time around the business as opposed to particularly creating separate streams of income. Yes, generally. Um, You probably could create separate streams of income if you had a business with some automated elements. Uh, That would be a a, a bit more unusual. Generally, automation and delegation is to free up your own time and then that makes your business a bit more passive. So a lot of passive income sources start out as being very active, and then you passivify them through automation and delegation. Yeah, building an app and a web- or a website. Okay, building an app is really hard. Um, if it's a mobile, have you tried? App, uh, yes. Have you? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it it's sounds hard. like a nightmare. Yeah, building a website is easier. Uh, with tools for websites and stuff, HTML, CSS, fairly easy to learn. You can learn those in about a week if you find a YouTube, YouTube video and do if you, and dabble with it a little bit. There's all this stuff around like progressive web applications. There's ways of building iOS and Android apps through building a website and porting it onto Android and iOS. It's all, it all gets very complicated. Um, I think the thing is, if you can build a website, there's a, there's a branch of software called Software as a Service, SaaS, S-A-A-S. That is where some, so something like Patreon is actually Software as a Service. Um, Patreon has built the software that allows memberships to work. And therefore, when creators sign up to Patreon, they're paying a subscription or paying a commission to Patreon. Something like PayPal is weirdly software as a service. It is a piece of software that allows people to accept payments. Um, When I was in med school, my brother and I built something called BMAT and UCAT Ninja, which was software as a service. It was a website that allowed people to subscribe for £30 a pop to do questions to prepare for their medical school entrance exams. These are all the things, these are all things that you can do if you want to build a website from scratch. It's, it's quite hard to do that. Um, but I mean, most like Uber is an, an app which someone built, Twitter, Facebook, all these like incredibly high valuation, ridiculously successful apps or, or ultimately someone starting off Mark Zuckerberg building Facebook in his dorm room or building hot or not in his dorm room. It's an interesting skill to have, and I still recommend to this day if anyone wants to get rich on the internet, learning to code is a really, really useful skill to have. Um, but it's not easy. Is there anything that you've missed off? Because you did this video a while ago about different passive income streams, and we've gone through some of them today. Looking back, is there anything that you've developed since then that you wish that you put in? I think one interesting passive income stream that we haven't really talked about is coaching. And we mentioned it a little bit with the personal trainer stuff. But if you can become a coach for someone, I know a lot of personal trainers do online coaching whereby they don't even need to be on a Zoom call with someone. They can just sort of create like a workout plan. And for example, Athlean X probably has an online coaching program. He's probably not the one actually tracking people's macros and stuff. There's probably some level of automation and delegation there. So I think that coaching is an interesting income stream because you don't need that many coaching clients to make a decent amount of money. If you have a small audience, you can monetize them pretty effectively through coaching, provided you're teaching something useful, you're providing value to your audience. Um, so that's an income stream that people can double with if they want. Chris Sparks has an interesting article about that talking. So just search Chris Sparks 
and consultancy, I think he called it. And it was just discussing how people don't really see service-based businesses on the internet the same as many others. He was identifying the fact that a lot of weight lies on your shoulders if you want to be, whether that be an online coach or a mindset coach or someone that's helping someone with teamwork or working through relationships or dating advice, whatever it might be. It is great, but the scalability of that is inherently downturned because you, for the most part, are the person, you're the product. Exactly, yeah. One half an hour of your time equals one half an hour of your customer's time, which means that if you only want to work eight hours a day, you can only have 16 customers a day, yeah, as true. opposed to the scalability that you get from products and online no, courses. Exactly. Yeah, coaching is a very, it's, it's not passive. Unless you find a way to automate and delegate it, which kind of takes away from the charm of it being you as their personal coach. Yeah, yeah. So to recap, we've got differing amounts of input in terms of both time and capital that we need to use. Yep. Looking to try and have a spread of a, a variety of yep. income streams as possible is good because it hedges you against different markets either moving up or moving down. Yep. It also means that you can monetize more effectively across different streams and building an audience, going audience first, adding value first, thin end of the wedge, yep. over delivering on the freemium side. Yep. That is something that's going to help. Anything else? What else yep. has been missed off from the, from the recipe for success? Um, I find like well, when, when I'm thinking about passive income, uh, I kind of often think of the three C's which is, I think, something that Naval talks about, uh, capital, code, and content. And you can make money through capital by investing in stocks and investing in real estate. You can make money through code by building an app, building a website. And you can make money through content by creating a YouTube channel, podcast, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, writing a blog, writing a book, all that kind of stuff. And then, the, then you've got the actual traditional businesses like selling a thing or selling a service and then applying the delegation and automation processes to that. But capital, code, and content have an unfair advantage in that they benefit from the scale from uh, pre-existing passiveness, i.e. capital, and the internet, i.e. code and content. Whereas a traditional business, you have to do a bit more extra work to make that into a passive income source by delegating and automating. And even then, traditional businesses are so much lower margin. Like, you know, if you're selling a physical product, it's just going to be lower margin than if you're selling a piece of code or a piece of content. So that's sort of how I think about it in my head. I think it might be useful for people to, to, say, to have that uh, framework. I like it. Ali Abdal, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with what you do, give us shill your online wares. What shill my online wares. Yeah, just check out my YouTube channel. Search Ali Abdal on YouTube. It'll probably be linked in the video description. It's all good. Sick. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.